Welcome, everybody. We're going to hear a song in just a minute. Okay, so just while people are joining, we're going to watch a video here. This is the No No Boy song called Crystal City. All right, so that was the Nono Boy song, Crystal City. Um, welcome to this webinar. My name is Natalie. I work here at the Princeton Public Library. And real fast, a couple of housekeeping notes. I wanna make sure everyone knows that while this event is virtual, the library is open. You can come in and browse books, use the computers, um, study, work, and our hours are actually expanding tomorrow. So check our website, princetonlibrary.org for our expanded hours. Um, so we're gonna chat, we're gonna listen to a few more songs and then toward the end of the hour, we're gonna open it up for some audience Q&A. So you can put your questions in the Q&A. And just because this is potentially a family event, I wanna flag that there's some strong language in some of the songs. There are some curse words, there are some racial slurs. So I just want everyone to be prepared for that. Um, and now I'm super thrilled to introduce our guest today, Julian Saperiti, who's gonna talk with us about Asian American history and music and his project, No No Boy. So Julian is a Vietnamese American songwriter and scholar born in Nashville, Tennessee. And his work, No No Boy, has transformed his doctoral research at Brown University on Asian American history into concerts, albums, and films, which have reached a broad and diverse public audience. His latest album, 1975, released through Smithsonian Folkways, has been hailed by NPR as an act of revisionist subversion 
and American songwriter called it insanely listenable and gorgeous. So by using art to dive into highly divisive issues such as race, refugees, and immigration, Zapparidi aims to allow audience members to sit with complication as music and visuals open doorways into difficult histories. He currently lives in Portland, Oregon, where he's doing his best to relax and follow the muse. And he holds degrees from Berkeley College of Music, the University of Wyoming, and Brown University. So Julian, welcome. As you know, I'm a big fan, so it's really awesome to have you here. Thanks so much, Natalie. Yeah, this is a real treat, like I was saying before we uh, started this. I'm always trying to go out of my way to do any kind of public school or public library thing. And uh, it's just really nice. That's where I feel most at home as uh, someone who considers himself a teacher as much or more so than a, a musician. So this is great. And I look forward to talking about whatever you want to talk about today. Yeah. So as you mentioned, you're a teacher and you're a musician and you're also a scholar. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this project started and how all those different types of work kind of came together for you in this? I mean, yeah, so all of those identities or vocations, I guess, are certainly how I consider myself, none above the other, and, and sort of all of them weaving together to hopefully uh, help create a practice that's both useful in the classroom as well as on concert stages and doing stuff like this, which um, I do a lot of. Um, and I, I guess the musical part comes first. I grew up in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, in a music industry artsy family. Um, and so that was always just a big part of how I related to the world, um, you know, whether it was hanging out at my dad's office on Music Row with like country music singers and things like that and learning the history of all of that stuff or going to square dances in Tennessee or being in the indie rock scene, like a very diverse musical upbringing. Um, and then, yeah, the scholar teacher part comes way later. That's like in my late 20s, mid 20s when I drop out of my or my band breaks up. Uh, which was touring all over and I kind of retreat to Wyoming to climb rocks and read books basically and just learn because I, I like you said I went to Berkeley College of Music so I didn't really read any books until I was like an adult I just, I just played music and um, yeah I've always been really passionate about history I don't know whether that's growing up in the south with all the civil war things you have to go through all the time as a kid but I always really liked history um, and so as a grad student, this project kind of really starts because I get into Asian American history out West, uh, the Rock Springs massacre in 1885 in Rock Springs, Wyoming, in particular, where all these Chinese miners were killed by a white mob and the Chinatown was raised. And then the, uh, Japanese American incarceration camp at Heart Mountain. So I basically came across these sites, um, which a lot of kids in the state don't even know about when they go to high school just on like rock climbing trips or just trips I'd be doing, uh, you know, going up to Yellowstone or something. And that was the first time I sort of approached Asian American studies uh, was just, I don't know, the, going to these sites and these sites resonating with me. And then when I got to Brown for my PhD, because someone said when I was teaching after I did my master's at Wyoming that you'd make more money if you had a PhD as a, as a teacher, um, I ended up at Brown, which is a total cultural shift for me, but I got to really study this stuff and, and, and learn from some real geniuses and be around students who were geniuses and it was incredible. Um, and that kind of like made me dive into this history even more, made me ask questions about my own Vietnamese American history, which is just so bloody and difficult that I always wanted to avoid it. Um, and then I think I was just so overwhelmed by the material I was studying um, the songwriter thing kicked in. Uh, you know, I just had so much oral history that I'd recorded, so many archives I'd been through. And like we were talking about right before we came on, the 2016 Trump election happens. And I'm starting to like study all this stuff, like about, you know, immigration of Asian Americans and how difficult that's been, the illegality of people who look like us over the years that I decided like, I don't really want to present these um, papers like I was doing at conferences. Uh, I appreciate that. I appreciate the dialogue, but it's not my natural form of expression. And I, I'm not going to really be able to get across what I'm studying and how important this history is to me unless I start writing it into song. And I've been really lucky that I've been able to share it with a lot more people. Um, and that's, that's how we got here today. Well, um, so... You mentioned Heart Mountain. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I want to play a song that you wrote about Heart Mountain, um, about a band that formed there. So could you tell us a little bit about um, how you learned about that band and wh why you wrote the song? Yeah, so this band is called the Georgie Gawa Orchestra, and they were one of the many bands and musical groups that formed during the Japanese American incarceration across the 10 camps. There was a very rich artistic culture. And for some people, um, arts and music became something they could do, which they wouldn't have actually gotten a chance to do had they not been incarcerated, ironically. So kind of like a silver lining to a horrible situation. And the Georgie Gawa Orchestra, they were led by this dude, Georgi Gawa, who was a semi-professional touring jazz musician, had played on both the both coasts, both sides of the Pacific um, in Japan and California before the war. And when they all got locked up, as musicians do, they kind of find each other, um, maybe because no one else wants to hang out with us. And um, they start this band. And uh, they're such a good, formidable band that they are asked to play outside the barbed wire of Heart Mountain, Wyoming. They play war bond drives, they play um, Mormon dances, proms, and then they always have to go back behind the barbed wire. So I was just really inspired by the story. I saw this picture of this band in the museum up there and it was the first time even having gone to a jazz college, seeing Asian American faces with like pop instruments. You know, most of the time people think of us as playing violin or um, <laughs> piano <laughs> and to see folks who looked like me relatively speaking especially people who lived in Wyoming who were Asian like that's a very small overlap I felt like a kinship right there and then I became really great friends with um, Joy and Denise Terraoka Joy was actually the singer in that band one of the singers and Denise is her daughter and Denise has taken me all over San Francisco and helped me record oral histories with the Japanese American and Asian American community and, and Joy, who's the last living member of that band, is really like family to me. And she e has emailed me in the past when weather gets bad, like real grandma stuff. <laughs> and like when stuff was going down in Portland, she was worried last summer. So yeah, it's a story I try to tell because, um, you know, some of the band members uh, have asked me to. And it's really, really neat to be able to share it through song. The flyer red musicians needed So young Yone grabbed the silver mouthpiece Tracked down a kid who brought a trumpet to Pomona Let Yone have it on a free two-year lease Joy Terra Oka Ne Takashida Went to the tryout, she was only 16 With some girlfriends to cheer her on Their club was called the Rodells Mom said if you keep up the school Joy, you can't sing Georgie Kawa, Oji Nisei He toured up the coast and even played Japan Before the war, they ripped up the Florida Ballroom and don't sleep on the show Tokians Under the starlight, they dance behind barbed wire Under the mountain, it meant something to say Stuck between two countries in a fire The best goddamn band in Wyoming Little Ted's best show, rep the cardiac gang The clarinet kid, the Nisei Audi show Stop by rehearsal in a tall paper berry once he joined up, sister, it was on They practiced daily, gig on the weekend Stirring up those dusty mess halls Teenage bodies unchained from their parents And them old folks, they really lost it all The only swing band left in Wyoming that got them out some nights until dawn Warp on drives and power moments Dancing in love Bunch of chaps playing jazz At the Thermopolis prom Under machine guns They dance behind barbed wire At below 
zero, it meant something to say. Angelinos mixing up with farm kids in the choir. The best goddamn band in Wyoming. Gawa, he split for Chicago With Kamiko in the fall of 44 He left the band to Tets Joy went with her family to D.C. As for Yoni, he had to join the war And that's a story from Old Hot Mountain I'm the best band you never did see Locked up in prison camps for no fucking reason but they still found a reason to sing The best goddamn band in Wyoming 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 I hope everyone enjoyed that song. I tried to put the lyrics in the chat, but it didn't work. But basically, as you heard, it's telling the story of all these kids who are incarcerated in Heart Mountain and how they find each other and start this band. And I wanted to ask you about this one lyric in particular that I find really moving about um, the relationship between the kids and their parents. And I think in a lot of the incarceration narratives from this time, there is, um, you know, conflict happening between the generations, which has to do with, you know, even before they were in the camp, some of some of the parents were born in Japan and had immigrated. Some of the kids might have been born in Japan. Many were born in the U.S. Some people were born in the U.S. and then educated in Japan. But then, of course, everyone's living together in these really tight quarters. And like, what does it mean to be? incarcerated with your parents when you're a teenager and trying to have these experiences of growing up in a camp. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about that. I think that comes up in a couple of your songs and in a lot of these stories that I've read and heard about. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, for me, there's a, cause I didn't grow up in a specific Asian American community and in fact was really isolated. So I really just grew up trying to run away from being Asian American. That was my connection to being Asian American. So when I've been, you know, invited into some of these families and hearing their stories, uh, I think of them more as just sort of this like stories of immigration. And so, like you said, for a lot of us second generation people, people born here uh, of refugees, of immigrants, there's there's always this kind of like either language divide, cultural divide. When I was growing up, like Vietnamese food wasn't really cool yet, like it is now, like, and no one was, Asian food wasn't that cool, like even sushi, like when I was born in the late <laughs> 80s, like, which is crazy, like in a place like Tennessee, um, and certainly boba wasn't something people had heard of, like all this stuff we take for granted. So I look at something like the camps in that moment in time, and you have this sort of accelerated um, uh, generational divide in so many ways, because it's very unnatural, because people are they're prisoners. They're being locked up in these small little tar, tar paper shacks and sometimes having to live, you know, five family members to a room. And when you're a 16 year old kid, uh, what could be worse, you know? Um, and so, yeah, these dances were spaces which uh, almost without exception, none of the Issei, the first generation came to. There, there certainly were spaces like talent shows where there was a melding of Japanese and this more quote unquote American like jazz music stuff. Um, but by and large, these dances were at Nisei, second generation kids. And it was a space to get away. It was a space to, you know, like anyone who has played music or danced, which hopefully is everybody, you know, is this, this place of solace that you can be going through the worst times, you know. Uh, and, and that's what I've looked for, you know, in these histories that I study, whether it's in Asia or in the United States, these, these moments of um, making sense uh, out of... Uh, 
a, a completely senseless thing that's happening to you, whether that's war or incarceration or just detention. And so, yeah, I remember, I remember though, like, you know, every, my friend and label mate, uh, Nobuko, who's a historical um, Asian American folk singer, she named her album 120,000 Stories, I think, because um, there's 120,000 people who were incarcerated, right, in this history. And you have to really look at each individual story because everyone is very different. You can get the broad strokes of big numbers, but what kind of empathy, what kind of path to empathy does that really create if you don't have that small moment, right? So if we're zooming out of like a dance, which is what I always go to because I'm a musician, that's how I relate to history. I always think back to this woman named Sachi who I met in San Francisco, Denise, the daughter of Joy, the singer from this band, um, Denise Teraoka. Uh, took me down to the, I think it's called the Japanese American Cultural Center in Japantown in San Francisco. And she was like, all these people are in, in the camps, you should interview them because they haven't really told their story very much. And it was all these old women playing mahjong, like <laughs> they just get together every day and play mahjong. And they didn't really want to tell me anything at first, totally understandable. These are hard histories. And sometimes, you know, people haven't even asked them about it. So they don't really think it's important. It happened so long ago. And I just was like, okay, can I hang around and just play Mahjong with you? So I hung around for like a couple of days and just, just, you know, was human and they were human. And eventually this woman, Sachi was like, well, actually you wanted to know stuff about camp, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you know anything, like remember anything about like going to a dance or something? She was like, well, not much, but I remember, you know, we had refreshments like brownies uh, at one dance. And I remember like sneaking them, putting them into my dress so I could take them home to like my mom. You know, and I was like, that's amazing. So if you just like start there, this totally human moment, this beautiful moment, and then you zoom out and you go, you have to like go to the barracks, right? This built environment that's very oppressive. And then you have to go to the, the cold and the dust and the snow of a place like Wyoming. Then you zoom out further and there's the barbed wire and the guns pointed in and the searchlights. And you zoom out further and there's really not much around it. The, the desolation, you know, an LA kid having to come to this space. I think that's that's how I'm very interested. And and then, like you said, that that generation gap, how people managed it or how it split open further because of this event. That's a that's a story intrinsic to the dance. And, you know, and that's what songs are so nice about. You can kind of hide what would you know normally take an entire article to say in a line of poetry, you know, and hopefully, you know, for me, I have this all sourced because I have to do it for my Ph.D., but I think that's what's beautiful about these different artistic expressions, right? We all learn differently. And so if you landed on a line like that and helped you think more about what you'd read or heard about in this history, that's cool. Yeah, and I love what you said about taking a small moment and then kind of zooming out to this place. Um, and that's a place you've been to. So you, you know, you've been as a 21st century rock climber, I guess, or yeah. scholar, traveler, but See, like seeing that landscape and kind of being able to imagine yourself into it. I think um, the way that your music is so like deeply embedded in these specific places and sites of history is something that really spoke to me um, because I think that's the way that I relate to history too, is like you can read about a place, but then when you actually go there and you know a little bit about what happened there, you can like feel, you know, you can feel it all around you and you start like, imagining from the pictures that you've seen that there's like, like ghosts everywhere and for me it's like a very spiritual thing and so I wonder like how do you if you like how do you square that with being an academic like as you said all of your songs are like very sourced but there is also this kind of there's like something more than just like footnotes you know yeah that you're like I, mean, like, I don't expect a lot of doctoral students to start um, making art or their advisors more importantly to let them but I think it's a good way to go like I said I mean I've got more degrees than I need and anyone's welcome to buy one off me at this point but like you know I really appreciate having to do all that academic work so you're grounded in those courses that you take and what your advisors teach you and the old ways of doing things and the citations and the oral history collection and all this kind of stuff but I also think that like once you do all that, you know, like I said, academic prose is really no one's chosen form of expression. It's something we all kind of get into because that's how journals are run. And we don't really question that because we all want tenure track jobs and publish or perish and all this nonsense. And I just sort of decided to sort of 
you know, with some help from a almost about to retire advisor at Brown to just sing, sing my dissertation, or at least a, a good part of it and see what happens. And uh, like I said, I feel very confident, confident in the, the scholarly practice behind my work and, you know, uh, having all the sources to back up the songs, but for those kind of, you know, hidden histories of marginalized people, which is almost everybody, or to just get at the minutia or the quotidian experience, which is often not recorded, you do have to do some historical imagining. And any historian who says you don't, I don't know what kind of practice they have because you have to, you know, pick up pieces. And especially for me, when you're so interested in sound as opposed to the visual thing of history, right? So I always say history is often muted and we, 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 we quote people but we rarely talk about the size of like their like body cavity and like the tone of their voice or if they had a lisp or not, or, or like, you know, the accent that they used that we don't actually talk about the sound of the words that were said. And to me, that's so interesting and important, especially when you're trying to recover music because the Georgia Gawa orchestra, none of those orchestras in the camps ever recorded, you know, who was interested in, a, in, in the U.S. anyways, in a Japanese American jazz band who was like pretty good, but not great. But then you have to go back and look at repertoire and just imagine like, okay, these are like half high schoolers, half professionals. What's that blend going to sound like, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, and that's where those lived experiences of actually having lived in a state like Wyoming, although 70 years later, um, having been to this site so much, having like uh, walked around old barracks and listening and actually recording the acoustics of it so you can understand the, the echoes um, and the reverberations of the space, not only metaphorically, but literally. That's where that's important. Um, and when I lived in Wyoming, I, I led a small jazz band out of Laramie. And as far as I know, we're one of the only <laughs> jazz bands in the state. So it's not anything like what those people went through at Heart Mountain. But, you know, there's not a lot of us Asian people leading jazz bands in the history of Wyoming. So like I said, there is some kind of lineage there. That's awesome. Um, I know on your new album, a lot of the sounds that you've like mixed into the songs came from some of these sites, right? Yeah. Can you tell us about how, um, yeah, how that worked? Well, like you, Natalie, when, I mean, I have just such an interest in history through place. And, you know, I was lucky to have some colleagues at Brown who also were interested in place. So I've traveled with a lot of them to these sites, to detention centers down at the border, trying to make those connections, you know, through, um, you know, kind of American response to immigration, um, overreaction potentially, and, and the, the similar built environments of an ICE detention center and a barracks uh, during World War II. Um, or the Angel Island Immigration Station. And so when I would go to those places, I'd always just have my field recorder, this little Zoom audio recorder, and I would bang on the barrack walls or run my hands through the gravel of a cemetery, like a Chinese cemetery in uh, Oregon, or um, bang on the barbed wire of an ICE detention center. And then I would make those into drum kits, more or less. So every song on my new album, 1975, all the percussion sound, uh, with few exceptions, is just the sounds of those places. And for me, you know, you mentioned ghosts. That's something that I think about a lot because maybe it's a poetic and not too academic -y way to think about it, but um, yeah, that's what you, you feel. And so you try to take those sounds with you, take those places with you where you might find inspiration. Um, and yeah, I was recorded most of these songs by myself, uh, playing most of the instruments and having those percussion sounds that were made of uh, you know, sand or gravel or metal or wood or just birds singing in these places. That was just really inspiring while I'd be singing or playing guitar and fleshing out these recordings on top of it. Cool. Um, I want to talk more about um, these connections between the histories that you're writing about, learning about and kind of grappling with and then, you know, things happening in the present day. So Gonna put another song link into the chat. Let's do it. I hope everyone's able to keep up with this high tech <laughs> YouTube clicking. I know it's not always the hardest, uh, easiest for everyone. All right. This one, it's got the lyrics in Vietnamese on the video. And I don't so, remember. So, for all of you who can speak Vietnamese <laughs> or read it, good you can for read you. Vietnamese. Yeah. Um, okay, so we'll come back in five minutes again. So, 4 30 six and talk more about it. 
kind of bringing together a bunch of different stories mm -hmm. right there's a story about um this doctor um there's 
part of your mom's story, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then kind of you in 2017, reading the news and feeling so um, depressed, right? Yeah, overwhelmed, depressed, I think pretty common for a lot of at least like, you know, progressive liberal artsy people during that time period up till now. Yeah, and um, as I, I mentioned when we were talking before, so in 2016 and 2017, I was working at an Asian American immigrant advocacy organization and um, in the South, and it was such an intense time. And I, um, the video we watched at the very beginning about your trip to um, Texas mm -hmm. and visiting the um, World War II Family Detention Center at Crystal City and then the present day Family Detention Center in Dilly, Texas, um, made me think about when I visited a immigrant detention center in South Georgia as part of that job. And just like, I think a lot of times we talk about how it's important to know our history or else we're doomed to repeat it. But sometimes you know it and then it's still repeating and you feel so helpless. Like what, um, I guess, what is it like for you to know so much about these things that have happened and then look around and see them happening, you know, all over again? Yeah, I mean, well, like you said, that song we just listened to, Boat People, it starts again with like a primary source of, I think it's a 1978 Canadian Broadcast Corporation interview with some with a boat person, Dr. Tran. And it's the, the main narrative is just verbatim, just stealing from his interview, basically, um, in a respectful way, I hope. And then, you know, layering that on top of what my mom went through. She, she left Vietnam in 68 on a student visa. She was really lucky. Um, and she got out and never went back to Vietnam until 2013 when I went back with her and my brother went back. Um, and then that was all writing that and thinking about that while you're watching Syrian refugees wash up dead in Greece or like crammed onto boats, you know, looking from a distance exactly like the boat people of Southeast Asia, you know, and, and thinking about why this keeps happening. And then, as you said, uh, you worked with some of the most inspirational people I've personally ever met. Uh, so shout out to those people down in Georgia. Um, you know, what you've seen, what I've seen actually going down there. I think a couple of things is that like, even for us, like, you know, good hearted people who cry over, you know, kids in cages, blah, 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 blah. Until you see that and like actually talk to people how does it stick with you? It's like what we're talking about historically, right? Like until you get down and, and find that small moment to connect with. So for me as a musician, finding a band or learning what people like studying a dance and then putting myself in those shoes, at least in my imagination, it's hard. It's because it's too overwhelming because the atrocities that these people go through that some of my friends have been through coming up all the way from Central America, literally walking all the way up to the border, then being rejected, kidnapped by the coyotes, held for ransom until they are extorted and can pay money just to get dropped off in Texas and then picked up by ICE having to live through that. And then the humiliation of going through um, during the Trump presidency, but still a really unhelpful to say the least immigration process. You know, something my mom luckily didn't have to go through because of just the historical contingencies at play of uh, Southeast Asians. We went in and bungled a war. So then we felt like we had to play the hero and let them all in and stuff like that. So that's why so many Vietnamese people were able to come over here. And then, you know, it's just too much basically. And that's what I like about songs that I, that I prefer over kind of prose writing is that the complications, those three overlapping stories at once. You know, the son of an immigrant who's like this political leftist scholar person can look at what's happening in Syria, can be merged with what his mom went through and what Dr. Tran went through. And it can all sit in one song. And hopefully if you read the lyrics and sit with it the way you sit with songs over and over, at least the way that I do, you know, whoever the dozen people are out there who actually listen to my records over and over and over the way I listen to Bob Dylan records, I know that they will be educated or at least have the tools to, to educate themselves on this stuff because yeah, this stuff repeats, right? But unless you actually dig into that history and take it to heart, you're, you're not gonna really recognize those repetitions or you're not gonna care if you don't go back and learn those things um, you know, in a real formidable way. And I, I need not think further than my own personal experiences in life because 
we're all messy humans. We all are just a series of mistakes happening over and over. And, you know, I grew up in the South in the 80s and 90s. And as much as I love Tennessee, as much as I love Nashville, you look back and you think about, well, all the like, uh, inherent racism and misogyny and homophobia that I grew up with that all my classmates grew up with. And how long does it take to break those cycles of, you know, just sort of bad behavior? And it's still an ongoing process. I'm 35 years old. And there's still relationships that have crumbled because of my own toxic behavior that stem from like those never learned, you know, good behaviors that is a, a real... It's, it's, a, it's a mountain to climb. And so if we all have that at the individual level, like you really got to go back and sort of have this like come to Jesus moment of like, this is a country that was built on some uh, really horrible stuff. You know, it was built by many geniuses as well and many people who did amazing things. And that's all mixed up together. And that's a complication of being human or, or being part of a society. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's, I've, I've had fewer and fewer answers, the more, more and more educated I get. Um, but I look to myself first and I think about like, okay, when you stop being, when you start like living a life that's like totally clean and, uh, you know, monk-like, then maybe I'll start like casting stones. But if anything, I just kind of have sympathy on all sides for where we are right now, which is a country that seems to be doing better in the long arc, but, um, also, like I think you recognize, can overwhelm you when you go down to a detention center. You say, didn't we learn when we like made all the Chinese illegal in 1882? Didn't we learn in 1924 with that Immigration Act where all the Asians became illegal? Um, you know, but I don't know if we are, but yeah, it's tough. Yeah. Worst answer ever, sorry, <laughs> it's just a circle. No, I mean, I think, yeah, I think, um... It is, yeah, I mean, first of all, a lot of people don't know, right? Even even those of us who have this history in our families, we haven't learned because we haven't learned that history. Yeah. Um, but even when you do know it, right, that doesn't mean you can change what's going on. Um, I want to play one more song for everyone, which I think you just kind of led into talking okay, about great. having sympathy for, you know, all different sides and it's hard to judge and, um, we both have had the experience of being Asian American in the South and um, we don't have to get way into like <laughs> Vietnamese politics, Vietnamese American politics in the US South. But um, I wanna play your song, Tell Hanoi I Love Her because I think it, it complicates, like after listening to a song like Boat People, you think it's very clear cut like, oh, you know this happened and then you're gonna have this kind of politics about what's happening now. Mm -hmm. but. That's not always the case, and you know it's more complicated. So let's watch the song. It's three minutes, so we'll come back in three minutes. And I just right. put it in the chat, so you can click on the link right out of the chat. Twice seven with two civil wars. A fool to think that this place could ever be yours. The in between, that's where we must explore. Tell Hanoi I love her Jenny's mother in the nail salon But as it starts, spangled t-shirt, tiger mom Saw the flag on my hat, told me to take it off Tell Hanoi I love her I keep no grudge against some old world kid not letting go now, that's a body side the sin. I named my Chrysler after Ho Chi Minh. Tell Hanoi I love her. I got an auntie over man alive Last election cast a ballot for 45 If I'd seen what she seen, I might see her side Tell Hanoi I love her I dream of junks or to sail away Wash your feet on the beach in High Long Bay My mother said once that's where dragons lay 
Just as needlessly Once I thought there was just one of me Tell Hanoi I love her Fumble with numbers I just wanna sing Ain't nothing sadder than some cook with an American dream Sometimes I think the most communist things Tell Hanoi I love her Hanoi, I love her Tell Hanoi, I love her Good choice, Natalie. Yeah, so some of my favorite of your songs are the ones that are about about you, about being Asian American in the South, um, about um, going to the Vietnamese strip malls in the South looking for something. Um, and you mentioned that this is your favorite song on the album. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about why. Yeah, it's so funny because one, I mean, it's ridiculous that this is basically a school project and I have to like, or I get to do like NPR interviews or even something like this, right? Because like, most of the time you're prepared for the academic thing of like six people at your panel is not a, not a bad crowd. Uh, and so it's such a blessing to share this work widely, but you see reflected in like the most popular No No Boy songs is like sort of how the discourse of Asian American studies in, in Asian America is, is skewed so heavily towards wealthier college educated East Asian folks, specifically Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans. And so a song like this, which is completely focused on the complications of a Vietnamese American community, which is, you know, economically not the worst off in the country, but still has some hardships and especially recent immigrants with immigration things, which, which you know all about, you know, trying to draw attention to Cambodia, the Philippines, um, Indonesians, and then Central Asians, Western Asians, South Asians, and expand the discourse around what is Asian American beyond like the iconography of the Japanese American, the Chinese American community, the lion dances, the cherry blossom festivals, the obons and, you know, and so I think that's, I'm happy whenever someone wants to talk about a song like this, because it really gets into the weeds of a not monolithic Asian American, let alone not monolithic Vietnamese, uh, you know, Southeast Asian American war diaspora community. And, and so it's really just going through a couple identities I have, you know, the first line is twice Southern with two civil wars. It's about being from Tennessee, but also about, you know, coming from uh, as a child of a mother who lived through a civil war back in Vietnam, a very recent one. And the politics that are very complicated in both communities, both you know, mostly white Americans in the South today with our adherence to a flag that is quite ridiculous in some ways and, and, and evil in other ways, but also I have a lot of sympathy for in ways that I think people who aren't from the South can't understand. And the same thing with, with South Vietnam, a country that doesn't exist anymore, but you will still see the flag with three red stripes on a yellow background flown in, in little Saigons across the country. There's still these rampant, like like kind of fervent, like anti-cap, anti-communist feelings. Um, in a way that's almost like nonsensical in a way that a lot of people in Vietnam have forgotten about, you know, that we still hold on to. So the song's just talking about, you know, an auntie who, two aunties actually, like one of the, the white women who helped raise me, very conservative Trump voters in Nashville who I would die for, who would die for me, who I love, who I can't dismiss, um, you know, talking about them and talking about a, an actual Vietnamese blood auntie who voted for Trump because about 40% of us did. And so, yeah, I really love, I like that song because I think it's, it's very clever and I pride myself on being clever. Um, certainly not a genius, but maybe clever. And uh, yeah, it's just great to, to have that out in the world because like I said, where I like to teach from are the small moments and those moments of complication, right? 
So people who came to this country as refugees, who then will tell me in Houston or in Georgia or like Orange County or Northern Virginia, wherever these Vietnamese people roam, well, I came here as a refugee, but I did it the right way. And it's like, what, what are you talking about? But I haven't been through what you've been through. I've never had to like lose my country. I've never had to lose my language. I've never had to build everything from, from the ground up. I've never had the, you know, the uber patriotism that you find in a lot of first generation immigrants that I can't relate to because of my privilege, you know, more educated second generation position. So it's about, you know, it's great that we're, those of us on the left are pushing this like agenda forward, which is based in, I think, humanity, but how we do it. I think sometimes needs to be discussed because like I said, as someone who grew up as a toxic, masculine, homophobic, partially racist person from the South, amongst all my great qualities that I got from being Southern, I'd like to think that, you know, forgiveness and rehabilitation should be paramount in our discussions of how we move forward as a country. But yet I, sometimes I think we just, we're looking for fights, whether it's through language or whether it's through politics. And that's why I like that song because it's just kind of chill, but getting at some really deep stuff. And that's where I'm most comfortable these days. Yeah, I love that. I think um, to me that speaks to like the concept of Asian American identity, which is you know, so many people with actually nothing in common, but like, can we come together and um, stand up for each other yeah. and do right by each other, protect each other? But also, how do you do that in a community that's like so diverse in so many ways and across political difference? But yeah, the idea of not not writing each other off um, and looking for, yeah, looking for what is, I guess, universal. Yeah, Between it's tough. Among, it's yeah. tough to do, but we're moving way out of those academic argument driven, you know, discourses that have leaked into the rest of society, like those ethnic studies discourses, which is it took scholars decades to come up with and are brilliant and lift up and raise marginalized voices and are necessary. But when you just use them as a hashtag or an Instagram post and don't do any of the homework behind it, you know, and you're upset because maybe you come from one of these marginalized communities and you finally have that moment that I think a lot of kids of color have of like, oh, the world, America sucks. America's terrible. Look what it's done to all these people. That's all true, but we still live here. And I'm not saying your, your anger is not righteous or it's wrong in any way. But, you know, when I got to Brown, it was a huge culture shift. And because I'm from red states all the way, I don't come from a particular educated family. Um, and I'm very broy. Uh, for an artist and for an academic, I'm just super broy. I love basketball and climbing mountains and stuff like that. And so I think I come off as like, you know, not your typical limp wristed Marxist. And so it was tough. And I just felt like people are, are sort of, we're looking for fights on both sides. I felt a similar way as I feel when I go to rural gas stations. And I kind of feel out of place down south because of the way I look. Um, and I just, I don't know, I just, there are human things. There are some like, I don't know if universal is the word we want to use, but there's just some tethers that do bind us, whether it's like music or food. And so, yeah, I just would like to go back there a little bit while there's, there's different levels of activism, right? That's what this really incredible professor Trisha Rose told me at Brown when I was freaking out after the Trump election. She's like, you don't have to go march every single day because if you do, you'll have to drop out of school. You won't do your homework. And she said, you just be the best scholar that you can be at, the, at whatever level that is. And, and for me, that's like conversing in public library conversations or having conversations in you know, red states for middle schoolers in Kansas, you know, wherever I end up on tour or, just trying to be of service down at the border, like studying immigration, but then actually helping in person, you know? And so, yeah, I don't know, but I appreciate you picking that song because it, it is um, one of my favorites on the album. And yeah, it's very, very Vietnamese with all its complications. And I like, uh, as much as I like singing about my friends in the Japanese American community, most of the literature has been written about them. And uh, there's a lot more of our stories that we need to tell. 
So let's take some questions from our awesome audience. So someone just asked, have you had any moments in which the historical empathy in your art has allowed you to bridge political divides? Yeah. You just, you just mentioned briefly. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, um, I don't play many shows anymore because uh, it, it just was too taxing. Like I just, I already am kind of a, you probably can't tell, but a pretty, um, uh, what's the word? introverted person like I can be on stage and be the eye of the hurricane but if I go to a party I'm just at the food the whole time looking down not talking to anyone so touring this material because of the kind of hybrid academic nature where I have to like spill my guts and all these ghost stories so to speak every night was just too daunting and it was just it was a disaster but when I have traveled I try to like I said do public school gigs if I can get like a university that bring me out to sponsor the trip I'll then try to do public schools or libraries um, for free or a lot less fee because that's where I think these conversations need to have and, and I know that like songs are just a better way to reach people who are opposed to your point of view than if I was like giving an academic paper one, because I think most of us would admit they're more interesting for most people and, and songs can weasel your way in their head through the melody. Um, and then maybe the lyrics stick a little bit. But I've just had moments like at my buddy's school in, at Cheyenne East um, in Wyoming. I remember we did this horrible assembly. It was just the worst gig in the world to play for 500 high schoolers. It's just like hell. Um, but a kid came up afterwards and was like, can you send me the chords to one of your songs? And I was like, oh man, that's, that's job done. Cause if, think about that, right? This is a song about a Japanese internment camp he never learned about from his teachers at this high school in his home state. And he's gonna sing a love song I wrote based in that internment camp. And he's gonna like go through the trouble of internalizing the music itself. Like, man, that's like, that's amazing. You know, and I remember in, in Montana, there was a, a, a rancher who came up after show and it was like, can I buy you breakfast in the morning? I was like, absolutely. And uh, he was just like, you know, I, I sat down, I thought about all this stuff and it really meant a lot to me. We just had a conversation over breakfast. Now, I don't know how he voted in 2020, but I know that at least we, we, we connected. And, and I remember also like in another part of Montana on that same trip, this kid, uh, afterwards, he emails and is like, just writes this page long email, which is so nice to get saying, you know, I'm, I'm a photographer in um, Billings. That's where we were. And most of my, because I'm an artist, like most of my friends are all leftist and progressive, but I'm fourth generation Montana ranching family. And uh, your concert was the first time, like I could sit down and think about immigration and not be mm. completely just turned off because you were doing it through songs. You were just letting it sit through visuals and music. And that was the first time he could just open up. And I think that's the way it is for most of us. We just, we, we're so triggered nowadays by words or topics or whatever that I've seen the ability for these songs um, to do that. And that's why, you know, like, like I said, I consider myself a teacher first these days. And honestly, this is just like a model for my students whenever I teach or you know, maybe other artists to do a little more research or ask their grandmothers about their stories and, and see what they can do with hopefully much better songs than mine. So I wanna, um, I wanna give people the option to leave because it is five o'clock, but I do wanna just um, ask you a couple more audience questions. Yeah, I'll stick so around, but for please folks split that have, if you need to split. Yeah, for folks that have to leave, I wanna encourage you to check out the No No Boy Project website. I think it's nonoboyproject.com. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yep. Nonoboyproject.com. And I'm going to be sending everybody an email with a little resource list that I put together if you want to learn more about the stories and Julian's songs and see some more awesome music videos. Um, here's another question. Um, will you be making a musical response to the current surge in hate crimes, harassment, and verbal and physical violence against AAPI people? Uh, not specifically. I mean, I've been asked this a lot in the interviews that I've been doing for this album. And, and honestly, I really actually hate the fact that my album coincided with, with this because I think it needed its own space and it just feels kind of icky to, it's just so much, so much to think about and talk about. But the thing I'll say is that, um, I don't consider it a surge, like par partially because like the statistics kept on this stuff are pretty new and we haven't been like documenting like when I was experiencing AAPI hate as a kid growing up, which happened at least once a year. 
Um, that never got reported or anything. And these are kind of new statistics. And if you look back, you just got to understand that like, it's a, it's, it's, it's an awareness of this AAPI hate um, more than, more than a surge of it. I think, I think certainly because of COVID and the, in the rhetoric from Trump's garbage mouth, um, you do have maybe some people emboldened, but I feel like that kind of xenophobia, anti-immigrant, um, anti-Asian, rhetoric and feelings have always been there. I mean, go through our immigration law history. And that's the thing I try to point out, like go back to our history. And that's where I hope an album like mine can be helpful because it will point you to, if you sit down and listen to the album and read the liner notes, I feel as confident in that as if you sat through one of my courses, um, you know? And so, yeah, it's, it's not to me a surge or anything that I'm glad more more Asians, I think, are responding to it, which is good. And maybe it's like an awakening for people. But um, yeah, that's what I've tried to tried to say is just that I think it's just if you go back to the history books, it's been a pretty steady, pretty steady row. And, you know, this this massacre in Atlanta, like this unconscionable thing to happen. But I mean, I live in a state where there's a place called Chinese Massacre Cove. It's literally on our map. So this is nothing new. Um, let me ask one more question from somebody in the audience. So it says, could you speak about your identity as a mixed race person? This is a question I asked you yeah. and a recent event that you did. Um, so could you talk a little bit about how that informs your work? I think it, it comes up a little bit in some of your songs. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like lately, I felt like I'm not speaking to like the Italian and Swedish side of me enough. I need to do some Italian Swedish albums, uh, which seem a lot more fun to do. Not that those people haven't had their hardships, I'm sure, Italians especially. But um, yeah, I mean, it's that in betweenness. I mean, that's like that song we just listened to. Um, wait, what's the lyric? Something about like the in between, that's where we have to explore. I think mixed kids. Um, regardless of it's if that's whatever your mixture is, which is most of us um, maybe can relate to that because that's that's what I want to to understand because even you know with more Asian American representation, more more women, more queer folks, more people of color, most of us don't fit into that one person who Hollywood puts up there or who you see on a TV show or that athlete or whoever your idol is. And I think it's, going that's where the process of going into your own identity and finding the uniqueness of it so you don't have to necessarily live up to any kind of stereotype good or bad or any type of um you know version of yourself that you might are supposed to fit in to and for especially those of us who grew up like in the south or the midwest away from the coast who didn't have any kind of ethnic enclave to to go buy our food from or speak our language in it's a it's okay you might have lost your language. That's just the historical moment you lived in. It's okay that you didn't grow up with, like my Asian cuisine is Chinese buffets in Nashville, Tennessee. It's like Asian, it's like Chinese buffets with the worst sushi and pizza and French fries on there as well. Like that is my Asian American. That's your authentic, that's your authentic That's my authentic, experience. that's myself, you know? And I think that's a lot of people's selves. I was looking at some demographics the other day and there's 24% of us live in the South. And yet again, that representation, that discourse was started mostly by Chinese, Japanese Americans in the 70s, college educated activists from the West Coast, who I have very little in common with. And so making your own space while acknowledging what people have done, what people have written is very good. But yeah, it's exploring that in between and, and feeling, you know, whatever your Asian-ness is, like that's like, that's your authenticity and just explore that more. And just hone that. I think that would that's where I am anyways right now. Cause yeah, I'm a I'm a Tennessee, Vietnamese, Italian, Asian. There's not a lot of representation and there never will be. So write your own songs. Yeah, I think I think that's a great note for us to end on. I think that's really powerful. And I know your music has really made me feel like there's room for all our stories, um, which is really powerful. So um I hope everyone's feeling inspired to learn about history, learn about your history and our history and make some art about it. Um, like I said, I'm gonna be sending out a resource list. Um, it's got some of Julian's videos, it's got some graphic novels, some online exhibits. Um, 
I want to shout out to New Jersey Asian American history, which you can learn about on my resource list. Um, Professor Urban, who is here from Rutgers, um, worked with some students to make some really awesome online exhibits about Asian American history in New Jersey. Awesome. Um, so I hope you guys will check that out. Um, check out more of Julian's work at nonoboyproject.com. And thank you all for being here. And Julian, thank you so, so much again for spending this time with us. Thanks for reaching out, Natalie. It's a pleasure. Like I said, please support your public schools and public libraries. And it's uh, and thanks for putting that resource list together. Like, like my secret mission is to just get a dozen people to read a book through putting out these records. And hopefully we're helping with this. All right. Thanks again. Take care, everybody. All right. Bye, everybody. I heard about a place called Little Saigon Everybody's got my face So mine won't have to grow so long Palm trees, a terrace seed A cafe where I belong Oh, I think I'd like to go to this place Little Saigon One day I'm gonna go to a place called Little Saigon Buy shoes in a little shop and silks from Vietnam Take lessons on the damn bow and play an old folk song Oh, I think I'd like to go Little Saigon